First of all, I know it's been a while since the, the conclusion of the show, but congrats on winning the Toughest Nails competition. When did that show end? Uh, conclude it. Um, the season finale, I think, was October second of last year. Okay. Okay. Um, what did you? What did you as a winner? What did you receive for the show? Um, well, in team, because you win also team prizes. So in in the team comp, I won eight thousand um, dollars for winning the whole thing on the individual was 200,000 and then a 2020 Ford F250. There you go. There you go. So yeah, the truck is all, uh, the, the truck was pretty cool. Um, right after the season finale, then Ford motor company called me and I think her name was Ann. She's like, Hey, uh, Murph, this is Ann from, from Detroit. I'd like to talk to you about your, your truck. Like, this is a pretty cool phone call. So I worked with the local dealer. I got to, I drove away a Ford um, F-250 on the show that was like a dark red, but in color, that was like for show purposes. Then I got to work with Ford. I got to pick the color, um, the, the model I wanted. It just had to be an F-250. So I partnered with the local Ford dealer and a, a company up, um, north of Kansas, well, around the Kansas City area, that's a motorsport company. And we uh, customized the truck. We lifted it. Um, it's a dream truck come true. Like, it's, I never got to, my last truck, it took 14 years to get it the way I wanted it. This one, when it showed up at the dealer, we did a big unveiling. It showed up 100% like what I wanted. It was amazing. That is outstanding. I uh, I can only imagine that you're, you're, like when someone's like, Hey, when you get rid of your truck, you're probably like when it falls apart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one will, uh, will keep for a long time, especially with the, with the way the cars are now, you know, they're having a hard time getting you know, inventory to the dealers. So the truck is actually worth more now a year later than when I initially got it, which is crazy. Yeah. I think you're right with the, with the way things are going. It seems like a lot of vehicles are going that, you know, it's more value to keep the, to keep the vehicle, which is really cool to see. Um, so I, I saw an interview on YouTube, uh, that you did and you mentioned in the first episode that your daughter was getting to, ready to start her military journey. How's that going? Uh, and where does she end up being stationed? Yep. So that's my daughter, Shelby. She's my middle, middle child. Um, she came home from school one day and said, I want to talk to you about the Navy. I said, okay, great. Let's, let's talk. So she was interested in the officer programs and she was going to go to Mizzou university of Missouri here in about an hour and a half away from our house, do the ROTC program, the whole nine yards. So she got the ball rolling, did everything she had to do, got accepted to the university. And then one day, several weeks later, she came home and said, no, I think I want to get my life started now. Uh, I want to go enlisted and, and leave right after high school. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> all right. So I understand that because that's what I did uh, from the Marine Corps side. Yeah. Um, but anyway, she, so she was there obviously for the last, the season finale of the show. She got to see that. And then right before the second episode of the show, she shipped off to boot camp. So she shipped to boot camp July last year when she was still 17. She turned 18 in boot camp. Uh, boot camp was extended for them because they had the quarantine two weeks before they started training. Then they had to quarantine two weeks in the middle of the training. So her boot camp experience turned into be about 12 weeks instead of the standard um, eight, I believe, that how long the Navy boot camp is. It was almost like Marine Corps boot camp. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Yeah, in the length it was, she said, I should have joined the Marine Corps. I said, well, yeah, you probably should have now since you were there just as long. She excelled. She did really well. Um, she was a, a drum major for three years in high school. So she she was used to taking charge, used to marching, um, you know, used to a, a formal way of doing things. She was also an athlete in high school. So the PT for her was relatively easy. So she did really well at her school in Illinois. She actually just got transferred to San Diego where she's going to her third school. Um, she's going to work on the Tomahawk cruise missile system. And then once she's done with that school, then she gets assigned to the USS Chosen, which is a missile cruiser. Ah, Chos Chosen Reservoir. Yes, exactly. So I thought it was pretty cool that my daughter who joined the Navy is going to be on a ship named after Marine Battle. 
That's awesome to hear. Well, before we dive further into, into reality television, uh, on Born the Battle, we always go back uh, to the thing that, that connects all veterans together, and that's that's the time that you know that military service is going to be the next step in your life. Uh, you had 22 years of service. Where did it start for you? When did you know that the military was going to be the next step in your life? Well, it's funny because I, in high school, I didn't, I knew right off the bat that college wasn't going to be for me. I, I was a decent student. You know, I didn't excel, but, I, you know, I figured I was a B, maybe a C student occasionally. I spent a lot of time in the, in the trades. You know, I was in like a vocational auto shop, wood shop, metal shop. There was a shop class. I tried to take it, but I also did, you know, I also took calculus and stuff like that in school too. So I didn't mind the academic side, but I just knew that it wasn't for me. So I checked out a bunch of trade schools, um, like automotive schools and things of that nature. And then I'm in English class one day right before lunch. And one of my friends turned around to me and said, Hey, what are you doing after school today? And I said, I'm nothing. He said, why don't you go talk to the Marine Corps recruiter? And I thought, man, Vernon really is cares about me looking out for me. Well, <laughs> Vernon was just trying to get people to join so he can get that promotion out of boot camp, you know, with referrals. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't think about that then, but anyway, but Vernon <laughs> took me to the recruiter. We went and, you know, that he put me in that little room and I took that little pre ASFAB test and then I took it and he, you know, he looked at the score and said, okay, let's, let's talk about the Marine Corps. And I think, I think I knew the military was something I was going to do. You know, I grew up in the yard, you know, playing army, so to speak. And you doing all the stuff that, you, you know, young boys do, um, you know, buying camouflage, hiding out, you know, just having fun growing up. So I always had yeah. an interest in the military, but I left the Marine Corps recruiting office going, yeah, this is what I want to do. So I went home, talked to my parents. Um, I don't think they were really surprised. I think my mom knew that the military was coming. My dad is an army veteran from Vietnam era. So he wasn't against it. Um, so they went and talked to their recruiter that Wednesday. And then Thursday after school, they picked me up um, at the flagpole. I remember walking out of the high school doors and there's a Marine, two Marines. One was a recruiter's assistant. They were both in dress blues. And I strutted out of high school going, man, that, that's my ride. I uh, See, I'm going with those guys right there. You know, it was a very proud moment for me because I'm like, I'm about to be part of what they are. Yeah. So they took me up to that MEPS that Thursday. Yeah. You know, I did took the ASFAB the next morning. You do the whole process. And then I enlisted actually for six years. Oh, wow. So you, you did six years right off the bat. Yeah, it was a five-year contract because of the length of the school's. But they threw out the hey, if you uh, if you go an extra year, you can become a private first class out of boot camp. I'm like, Sign me up for that too. So I was an easy sell, so to speak, what the recruiters <laughs> call it. But yeah, yeah, my first enlistment was six years. That's awesome. So, uh, what MOS did you start in? Because I saw a good cookie, saw that you were a sergeant major in your toughest nails feature, uh, but I also saw you in a full flight suit, uh, helmet, and everything. So, wh- wh- where did you start in- at your career at? And so I actually, when I first was in the Marine Corps, I was an avionics technician on Hueys and Cobras. Okay. So I, um, so, you know, avionics includes, you know, anything in the cockpit, radios, navigation, communication, and then you're talking all the sensors and equipment that send information to the cockpit. So it's various engine components, you know, like your alternator on your, on your engine, different things that um, control the engine electronically. So you work, avionics entails a lot of different things. Some of the weapon systems as well, you work with ordnance and work on the weapon systems as an avionics technician. So pretty much anything that involves a wire, electricity, signals being sent back and forth, that's what an avionics technician does. Gotcha. Very good. Um, I also noticed on the website, on the, on the Toughest Nails website, that you're, you said you labeled your proudest accomplishment was coming home with everyone on your last deployment. Where was your last deployment and, and what was it? Where was it? When was it? And what was the last, what was the mission of it? So after, so you know, like I said, I was aviation at first and then, but I wanted to be um, a sergeant major. And I knew that the route obviously was to go the first sergeant side. So when I got promoted to first sergeant, I went to second battalion, fifth Marines and did two deployments with them. Mm. So my first deployment, um, 
with them was, you know, peacekeeping mission in the Middle East. And we ended up bringing back all, all the Marines. So it, it was a good, I mean, anytime you can bring back all your guys, I mean, that's a su- successful deployment. So yeah, I think that was just because, you know, what happens overseas, you know, just a basic deployment in itself is dangerous, you know, deploying on a ship or offloading or doing operations somewhere overseas. But to bring everybody back was was a very good accomplishment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how many total deployments? You said two, two, five. Uh, where, how many more times did you go? I did a several when I was younger in the Marine Corps, when I was um, with the aviation side. And then my last two were with, with 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. And then when I got back from my second deployment from 2-5, that's the Marine Corps said, okay, you need to go somewhere non-deployable. And they said, hey, Fort Leonard Wood is where you need to go. I'm like, <laughs> okay, where's Fort Leonard Wood? And they're like, well, it's in the middle of Missouri. And uh, they, w- they weren't kidding because the, the nickname for Fort Leonard Wood is called Fort Lost in the Woods because it is literally halfway between um, uh, St. Louis and another city on the other side, about an hour and a half. But it's a huge training base for the Army. Um, the Marine Corps has four schools down there. And, you know, motor transport is the second largest occupational specialty in the Marine Corps. And the motor transport school is down there. Um, the MP school is down there, military police. What we know is nuclear, biological, chemical, NBC, but now it's called Seaburn. Yeah. Um, is down there. And then the engineer guys, the heavy equipment operators are down there. So I went there for about a year, and then that's when I decided to to retire. I was in the promotion zone for Sergeant Major, and I knew that if I got selected and promoted, that I would be off deploying again. And I just remember being gone for that 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 time in two five. That I knew that if I signed up, I was going to miss a lot of my kids' lives. And at the time, my oldest daughter was around. I think she was 10. So mm. I decided to, to retire. So it was a tough decision. You know, I, I achieved the rank of first sergeant. I was in the promotion zone for sergeant major. Um, you know, so my dream was to be a sergeant major and retire at 30. But I also knew that the sacrifice would be on my kids. And I heard enough people say um, at retirement ceremonies, I want to thank my spouse for raising our kids. You know, and I didn't, I didn't really want, I didn't want to do that because I wanted to be there to watch the achievements, to watch the different things that they do. And I'm glad I did. You know, there were times that adjusting to civilian life was really hard. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that here before too long. A hundred percent. But yeah, I'm glad I made the choice. Um, Before we talk about you getting out while you were in, Give me either a best friend or your greatest mentor. Uh, I would say that his name was, his name is Jared Thompson. Um, He's currently with the Burley Sheriff's Department up in Idaho. And so when I was going to school in, in Millington, Tennessee, which is all now closed, it's all down in Pensacola. I was a Lance Corporal down there going to school. And this, you know, at the time, and I'm sure it's still the same when you're a, private PFC or Lance Corporal, the corporal is like almost like a God figure. Yeah. When you see a corporal, you're like, oh my God, that's an NCO. And um, so Corporal Thompson at the time was a lat mover. He was with the infantry. And at the time in the early nineties, they, you know, the allocations for enlistment for the infantry were, were dwindling. So he wanted to stay in the Marine Corps and his, his options, one of his options was aviation. So he chose the MOS I was in. So he was a lap mover coming over to school and he took me under his wing. He taught me what it meant to be an NCO, you know, because uh, the air wing and the grunt side, the ground side are just different. You know, the ground side really focuses on the leadership where, you know, when you're talking avionics, the focus is fixing the airplanes. It doesn't mean the leadership's not there. It's just a different style. Yeah. But he taught me about leadership is leadership no matter where you're at. And he really mentored me, um, kept me out of trouble, like guided me in the right direction. Um, you know, told me what MCIs I should take out, 
and he just made sure that I was a well-rounded Marine. Very good. Very good. Um, you mentioned the driver that, that, that was family. I think that's a lot of driver for a lot of folks that, that get out and hats off to you. Cause I think, I think everybody knows when it's, when it's their time. Um, so you got out in 2012. Now I just got out three years after that. Uh, but that, you know, if you look at that, that's almost a whole enlistment. What was getting out in 2012 like for you? Um, you made your way to Lowe's. Was there any initial struggles with employment or just the transition of it all? And how, if you did, uh, how did you mitigate it? I wasn't sure. I wanted to do something with training. And so I, you know, I applied to probably like 60 different companies. Um, I did apply um, to country, to companies all over the Midwest because I knew Missouri was really nice. I wanted to try to stay in Missouri, but I, I tried for several places in the Midwest and I did some interviews. Um, some of them didn't work out. Um, some were just in areas that, man, I don't really know that's where I want to go. And then I was struggling to find something. And then one of the retired sergeant majors that was down in the Fort Leonard Wood area was an HR manager for Lowe's Home Improvement. Mm. <laughs> so I went to a career fair and he's standing there and he knows he's like, one, why are you retiring? So he gave me grief. <laughs> And then I told him why, and he's like, okay, I understand that. But he said, why don't you try Lowe's, dummy? I'm like, what am I going to do at Lowe's? And he's like, a hey, human resources manager. I'm like, I have no experience in HR. And he's like, so he broke it down for me. He's you like, were a first sergeant. Of course you do. <laughs> yeah. He's, then he broke that down to me. You know, he said, hey, you, you know, you do. The only thing, you have the leadership, the experience. You talk to people. He said, all you have to do is learn all the technical stuff, learn how the workman's compensation stuff works, learn how disability stuff works, work, learn how time off works in different circumstances. He said, that all, that's all in manuals and you can learn that. He said, but the people skills and the fundamentals of being an HR, any Marine leader has that potential. So I'm like, okay, I applied. And sure enough, um, the area HR called me a few days later set up an interview and that's how I got up to where I'm at now here in, here in Missouri. So when I transitioned up here, it was, I still miss the Marine Corps like yeah. very much. Um, it, I miss it so much that I didn't become part of the VFW, the American Legion. They have a small Marine Corps league up here. I would not be a part of any organization. I focused on my physical training because I, I do functional fitness stuff. So that was my outlet was my physical. Um, and that really helped my transition because out of everything that was, that I had in the Marine Corps, that was the only thing that was consistent. So, you know, cause you PT a ton in the Marine Corps. So I kept the PT going and that's what helped me mentally stay engaged. But I was afraid that if I went to the VFW or Marine Corps League meetings, that I would miss the Marine Corps way more than I ever did. Um, so I just separated myself from everything military. Like when I look back on it, so when I talk to veterans now that are separating, I tell them, go find your tribe to hang out with. Go find your fellow veterans because it'll help you. I totally separated myself. Even I, I had reunions that I, that I missed with friends from the Marine Corps. I wouldn't go to those. Like I said, I wouldn't be a part of anything. I wouldn't go to Veterans Day functions because I was afraid that if I did those things that it would make me miss the Marine Corps way more than, than what I already did. And like I said, now I talk to veterans. I'm like, that's probably, not, that wasn't the right thing to do. I mean, I broke down about four years ago and it was just overwhelming. So I went and saw a counselor because I didn't think I could handle like, the transition anymore. So it just gave me somebody to talk to, you know, somebody that was impartial that didn't know me from anywhere, but it just gave me somebody to vent to. So, and I think if I would have had the, the tribe, you know, those veterans to hang out with, no matter what branch they are, um, I could have probably leaned on them a little bit more instead of just trying to take it all on myself. Yeah, it's, it's almost like in a way you were trying to, I, and I get that trying to separate yourself to rip that bandaid off, to make it fade to make it part of like the past, but not having that support in that moment of the transition where you needed it, 
made you realize that, and let me know if I'm wrong, made you realize that how necessary that tribe is. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You said it really, really well. So, cause that support network, you know, could have been there to maybe say, Hey, what you're feeling is okay. That's normal. You know, yeah. we all felt that, or we still feel it, but this is what we do to mitigate it. You know, I, I tried to solve it all myself internally. So I was spending hours at the gym, you know, whenever I wasn't at work, I was working out. Um, I guess in my mind, I thought, you know, if I can stay physically fit, no matter what my hair or beard looks like, that can be cut off. If the Marine Corps needs me, I can still go back. Mm. So, I mean, I still train now. I mean, because I, I, I would have been in the Marine Corps 30 years last year. So I'm well past my my time of service. Um, but I, I just train now because I enjoy it. You know, I'm, I'm maybe I'm, I'm still driven, but now it's like, I got my official retirement certificate, like last, last month that says, no, you're officially retired from the Marine Corps. Here's your, your transfer to the fleet Marine Corps reserve certificate. So, um, but the transition was way harder than I thought it would be. And I think it would have been easier if, if I would have relied on, you know, my fellow veterans. Got you. Got you. What, um, what do you think was the most difficult aspect of the transition? Like, what do you think was the one, the, the thing that was like, that was tough. That's what, that's what made me realize that I needed my tribe again. I think a lot of it was, so when I was in the Marine Corps, you know, I got my education, I got my, my master's degree, um, why I was deployed. And I felt like the job, finding a job wasn't the hard part. I mean, it was difficult. Don't get me wrong. I spent hours applying, hours working on resumes, you know, hours like doing interviews or going to interviews. Um, but I think the, one of the hardest parts was learning the difference between work ethic between the military side and the civilian side. Um, so when I was the HR manager, um, they're like, Hey, this person called in sick today. I'm like, called again. Like, what are we going to do? They're like, well, nothing. Cause they have this many sick days or, you know, Hey, this is this, this person has an issue being late to work or this person has an issue doing that. And then what I learned was that a lot of managers are not leaders. Mm. They, they, they manage a process or try to manage their people, but they don't have the basic leadership skills. So I think that was a, a rough adjustment for me. Cause when I went to, um, when I went to Lowe's, I, they were good managers. Some of them were great leaders, but some of them were not. Some of them knew how to manage the process and, you know, manage a schedule, but they didn't know how to lead their people. So that was an eye opener to me. Because I'm like, you have people in a managerial position that are not leaders. And, you know, the military is not set up like that. So especially the Marine Corps. So that was a big adjustment in, in learning t to know that, hey, the, that standard for that company is their standard. They don't have to make, meet Kelly Murphy's standard. That person just has to meet the company standard. So I had to learn, you know, it's not my standard. It's the company standard. But in the military, you know, everybody follows whatever branch of the military they're in. That's their standard. So learning that adjustment, you know, learning that not everybody is um, disciplined as in the civilian life as what we are in the military. Even though we joke about, you know, our people that aren't so stellar in whatever branch, they, you know, it's a lot different than dealing with it on the civilian side. Yeah. Having to come to terms with it. It's uh, it, it is definitely a, a, a big adjustment. Um, like a hundred percent. Uh, so you found, you then found your way to the, to where you're at now at the university of central, central Missouri, right? Um, how did you get there and, and what do you do there? A couple years ago, um, Lowe's and I can't hold it against them. You know, everybody restructures and they do different things. So Lowe's a few years ago uh, decided to eliminate their HR managers from the store level. They went to like a corporate model. So that put me on the hunt for a job. So at this institution, along with many others, you have what's called a military and veterans career center or office or whatever the particular name is. But whenever a service member or a veteran or a veterans family member using um, benefits goes to school, 
you have an office that processes those benefits, you know, that way their tuition's paid or their book stipend, um, BH, you know, depending upon what GI bill they're on. Mm -hmm. So I was the director of the military veteran office here. I interviewed and was hired for that position. And because of the success of the show, um, I'm now in a new position at the university. I do community outreach and recruitment. So now I talk to veteran alumni about connecting back with the institution, you know, um, assisting, helping, mentoring, you know, service members and ROTC students here. And then I just go out and recruit uh, for the for the university. Very cool. Very cool. Um, how are veterans giving back to their institutions like that? Uh, what, do, what, what are you what are you looking to get from from alumni students uh, or what should universities look to to get from alumni students that were veterans? Well, I think a lot of our our veterans now still want to serve in in in, uh, in a capacity. So what I mean by that, we have a a couple of years ago, we have a we have a student veteran organization here and the student veteran organization president on Veterans Day. Um, he worked with the with the president of the university and we did a ruck march. So we met at the flagpole and we loaded our our rucks up with canned goods and we did a ruck through town. And then we ended up at the end of the, the ruck march was at the um the campus cupboard. It's like a, yeah. a you know, place where students can go get food. So we dumped off hundreds of pounds of canned goods at the end of the ruck march of the campus cupboard, uh, campus cupboard. So they, they did all that on their own. The, the veterans said, the veteran students said, you know, we want to give back. Um, and this is how we want to do it. So they took their day veterans day to, to do this, this event. And that's the way a lot of veterans are, especially around this university. They want to give back. They want to serve their communities. They want to be um, parts of leadership committees. They want to be involved. They want to help out the community. Um, and I think the the alumni want to do the same. You know, the alumni want to help uh, mentor our young students, whether or not that's through, you know, providing funding or their time. So that's what I do now is I just talk to those alumni and just say, hey, this is this is who I am. And are you interested in reconnecting and, you know, supporting, you know, the next generation of, of alumni from UCM? That's really cool. Uh, it sounds like you're also, in addition to that, it's like getting the veteran alumni together with the university to do something good for either the university or for the community. That's, that's really cool. Um, at the time we, we were recording this, uh, school was starting to get into full swing. Um, in that previous role, you were, you were helping people fill out their GI bill paperwork and the things like that, which, you know, from a VA perspective is really important. Uh, what's the biggest challenge you're seeing students facing when they enter college and how are you seeing them adapt and overcome to those challenges? Well, I'll use Kenny. Um, Kenny was our uh, student veteran organization president a few years ago. Uh, he graduated. He's, he's moved on. He moved to New Mexico to work with the forest service. But and this is before I got here. So he was a student. He started a few years before I started here. And so Kenny, there was no student veteran organization when he started school. Oh, wow. He would go to school and he sat, he sat in his truck between classes because he felt like he had nobody to connect with. You know, he felt kind of alone by himself. You know, obviously most of the students are traditional students. So he's a non-traditional student. You know, he served. Um, you know, combat time in Iraq. So his, you know, you have a 22 to 24 year old man who's a lot different than your normal 22 to 24 year old student. Yeah. So he just yeah. fell out of place. So what he did was started the student veteran organization. So he got a group of veterans together and they started hanging out in the veteran center and they started doing stuff like this, these projects, service learning projects. So veterans could do stuff together and also support the community. So I think one of the hardest things that a veteran student has is finding their tribe, so to speak, you know, finding that group of veterans that they can hang out with and they can relate with. Um, sometimes, and the faculty here is really great. Um, I have nothing but praise for the faculty. Um, they understand a non-traditional student, you know, not only, you know, you have working parents that are non-traditional students. So they do a great job 
But I think sometimes dealing with faculty is a little bit different because that faculty member is used to dealing with, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old students out of high school. So treating that non-traditional student, that veteran student is a little bit different. They're a lot more responsible than your average student and they've seen a lot of things. So I think faculty getting that veteran involved, you know, if you're talking about something in history, maybe that veteran's been there and seen that part of history. So get them involved in the class, you know? Yeah, that veteran student could be a great mentor to some of those kids that are in that that class. So I think the veteran just finding their place in the university. I think that's that's one of the biggest struggles. But once they find their place, man, they excel like crazy. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. I uh, I remember uh, I I was going through University of Arizona. No, excuse me. Uh, I was going through Arizona State when I first got out and uh, I was still I was still working full time at NASCAR at the time. And it's funny, I would get these phone calls from the university, you know, Hey, this is so-and-so counselor. Are you doing okay? Are you, are you, and I I just remember going like, yeah, I'm a 30 year old man. I I got it. I appreciate you. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate you. Um, but I'm not your traditional student. And so I, I I can totally understand when you're like, Hey, there, there might be a disconnect sometimes between the faculty and the, it was, I was very appreciative of, of it. And I can understand where some younger kids, might have gotten some value from that. And I was, I was more on the phone with, well, how are you doing? How are, you know, <laughs> with, the, with the counselor? Cause she was a, she was younger than me and, you know, and it, it was, it was funny. Um, and you said in another interview that everyone in your family is blue collar. You're the first one to get a collegiate degree. Um, what was it in? And it sounds like you finished it while you were in the military. Uh, have you used any of your GI bill or do you plan to use in your GI bill? So I realized during recruiting duty, you know, for three years, I told young men and young ladies all about these great educational benefits that the military had. And it dawned on me like, you you know what, you've never used a single one of them. (laughs) So within six months of getting off recruiting duty, you know, after getting settled back into my unit, I started classes. I went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I took classes at night. Um, And then, you know, within a few years, I got my my bachelor's degree. And then I decided, you know what, since I'm this far and I'm in the habit of going to school, I ended up um, starting my master's classes. And on my first deployment as a company first sergeant, I finished my last paper, um, sent it off. I was aboard the USS Dubuque when I sent that last email. And uh, I got an email back several days later. Um, My graduate capstone project was approved. And congratulations, you you will now graduate on this certain date. I'm like, that's pretty, that felt pretty awesome. So um, that's how my educational journey started was because I realized that we do have all these great benefits. Um, So I did use tuition assistance when I was in, I tapped into my GI bill, uh, why I was taking classes because, you know, my, the tuition assistance only goes so far and I was trying to max out my class load. So I used what was called, I don't know if they still have it now, but it's called top up where it allowed me to use my GI Bill while I was on active duty. So it allowed me to pay for the classes that wasn't covered by tuition assistance. Gotcha. Very good. Uh, I didn't personally, I started out, I started and we, you know, like in my military, while I was still in the military, I I started my same thing. It did, did the, uh, tuition assistance, but at the time it was like a hundred percent. So you didn't have to tap into the GI Bill. I think, I think that's changed. I don't think it's a hundred percent anymore. Do you have any of your GI Bill left? Are you looking to use it in the future? I do have some left. I, I've thought about starting my doctorate, but to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do like when I grow up. So (laughs) I don't know, you know, I don't know really what I want to do. So I've, I've looked at at, at getting my doctorate, but I just, I just don't know yet. No, I I hear you, man. I hear you. I just think it's really cool. Uh, First one in your family. Uh, I'm, I'm the son, son of a logger myself. Uh, first one in my branch to get one. I just think that's really, it's always a really cool story when you hear like, I am the first one in my line to get a collegiate degree. Very cool. Um, okay. So you ended up getting on and winning the first season of CBS is tough as nails. Uh, were you either at UCM or were you at Lowe's when this happened? Yeah, I was here at UCM. I was the director of the military veteran center when it happened. So the way it happened. So we had, so I started Instagram when I retired just as a way to track my athletic stuff. 
um, just to kind of have fun with sponsorship and t-shirt companies. And then in January of 2019, I got a message from a guy by the name of Jonathan. He said, hey, my name is Jonathan. I am a casting producer for the Discovery Channel. I like to talk to you about being on a TV show. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, you know, it's a scam, whatever. And he said, no, I'm like, I'm serious. Here's some information. Look me up. I'm legitimate. So I did. I looked him up. And we so I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take your phone call. So he called me. Uh, it was a Friday night. He talked to me about being on this television show and um, I did some Zoom calls and the, the show just never got off the ground for them. But I walked away thinking, man, that was a cool, you know, I've never been casted for a show before. So it was, it was neat. And then I didn't think anything of it. And then October of that year, October of 2019, yeah, um, Jonathan sent me a message and said, hey, CBS is doing this show called Tough as Nails that you, you need to apply. So he sent me like a link. Um, so I said, what the heck? Uh, I, I filled out the link. And then later that day, CBS, uh, a young man by the name of Gabriel, sent me a message to say, can you do a Zoom call? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'll do another Zoom call. So I did a Zoom call with Gabriel from CBS Casting. And a few days later, he said, hey, CBS loved it. Can you do another Zoom call? in a couple, in about a week or two. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, not a problem. So I did this Zoom call. This time it was with Phil Kogan, the host of the show, um, his wife and two of the other co-producers and some other people in the room. And then it feels like, hey, we scoped out your Instagram. Tell me about your deadlift. And then he, we just talked briefly about like my physical, why, why I would want to do the show. The phone call, the Zoom call only lasted a couple of minutes and I walked away going, okay, wow, I guess, well, that was nice. Maybe I'll be considered, you know, it was a short call. And then a few weeks later, um, Jenny, the casting producer for CBS, um, contacted me and said, hey, Murph, we want to fly you to L.A. in December for the casting process. So I flew out to L.A., spent a week out in L.A. where you do different casting things like a physical and some other stuff, you know, to make sure that you're physically capable and mentally capable of of doing the show. And you do some on camera, like a little on camera interview. And then right after January of the new year of 2020, I got a phone call from Jenny and said, hey, Murph, we want you on the show. Can you come out in a couple of weeks? But I need you out here for 30 days. I'm like, wow, 30 days. I just started a new job like six months. I'd only been here for six months. Wow. So I talked to the president of the university, kind of briefly told him as much as I could, because, you know, you you can't really give out information about the show. But, and, you know, I was able to share with him enough. And he said, absolutely, um, you know, go do go do what you need to do. So I made a UCM T-shirt because for the show, because I you, the people that have watched the show, know that we have two different outfits that we wore. We wore Carhartt gear on the days we competed as a team. And then on the individual part of the episode, we wore really whatever you would wear to work. So I wear a lot of flannels, especially in the fall. And then underneath it, I had a UCM shirt on. So I went out there in January of um, 2020 and we filmed for, um, we filmed all 10 episodes within that 30 day period. Wow. Quick, quick turnaround. Um, it's funny that you said Instagram. I hear folks sometimes, uh, you know, that they go and hire agents for shows like this to find and they do the research and, and, and this was completely for you. Instagram, the guy just reached out on Instagram. I think that's amazing. How, how do you think they found you? Because, you know, you, like I said, you have a healthy following on Instagram, but it's not like your full-time gig or anything. How, do, how do you think they found you? Well, for the Discovery Channel, they were looking for like a physically fit veteran is what they told me. And then um, and then I think the show, because, you know, the blue collar trades and we the military is really blue collar. Yeah. We just joke around and say green collar. You know, you think about all the trades that are in the military. You have motor transport. You have refrigeration technicians. You have military police. You have firefighters, you know, mechanics like welders i mean the military is one big blue collar force really um so they were the show was looking i think for a veteran to be on the show and i just happened to be in the right place at the right time and um 
you know, it, it was pretty amazing. You know, for season two, they had a retired Air Force Air Force Colonel on the show, uh, Merrill, so the first black female to fly the U two spy plane. Oh wow! Um, season season three, um, I'm willing to bet there's probably a veteran on season three. Season three premieres October six. And we're actually casting right now for season four. We're actually looking for for veteran applicants for season four for Tough as Nails, which will actually film fall of this year. Are you still involved with the show? You, you said we're still looking. Are you still? Is there still a way, a way that you're still involved with the show? Uh, well, I I help with um, I put out information for casting. So when they're looking for um, cast, I just you know try to put that on my story or my my Instagram or my Facebook story. Uh, reached out to different veteran groups and let them know that hey, we're looking for a veteran. This is how you how you apply. Um, and then maybe in a few years, maybe on an All Stars edition. Yeah. Um, you know the show is very getting very popular. We averaged I think four million viewers a night for season one. Um, the show was such a big success that CBS renewed a season three and season four at the same time. Which I guess I'm still learning about television, but that's a big deal. They normally don't. Um, renew back-to-back seasons, but they did. So like I said, season four will actually film the fall of this year. Wow. That's amazing. I didn't, I didn't know. Uh, again, I don't watch much TV uh, in the tr- traditional sense anymore. It's amazing that that was, that had the pull that it did. That's awesome to hear. Um, okay. So they wanted you. Okay. You went through the whole process. There's a, a sense they're like, okay, come on the show. What, what made you ultimately decide to say yes to them to do the show well you know what believe it or not it you know i told you earlier that i had a hard time um transitioning to the civilian life and i think the the appeal to me because once i learned about the show what the purpose was that it was a competition both mental and physical I wanted a chance to prove to myself that I could still bring it like I did when I was a first sergeant. So I wanted, I had a lot to prove to myself that I still could be competitive, that I could be productive, you know? So since retirement, I sat in an office and did HR work, you know, of course I worked out and stuff, but it's different being tested, you know, in, you know, the way that the military tests you physically and mentally. And I wanted to prove to myself that I could still do it. So that's why I really wanted to do the show. Um, I know in the interviews, they asked, you know, I said the most important thing to me was winning the title Tough as Nails because, you know, we, when we agreed to do the show, we didn't know since we were the first season, we didn't know until we taped episode one what the prizes were. We had no idea. Yeah. So I knew that I wanted to do the show because I wanted to prove to myself that I could still do it. Very good. Uh, on that show, did you find the challenge that you were looking for? I did. Um, you know, it, it was, it, this may sound a little corny to some people, but being on the okay. show was almost like a healing for me because I had missed the Marine Corps so much that the show, like we, people ask, how can you get so tight so fast? Because we just had a season one reunion. My team just had a reunion in Vegas two weekends ago. We hadn't seen each other since we filmed last February and we still chat through Instagram or through messenger. Um, uh, Still a chat going on. All six of us like just met in Vegas and spent the weekend together, had a great time uh, with lifelong friends. And it felt like the military because so we, we go there, you don't know anybody. So in a short amount of time, you have to get to know your team to accomplish a job in a short amount of time. And that's what the military is. Sometimes you get transferred somewhere. You have to get to know your personnel in a short amount of time to accomplish a mission. Yeah. Well, this time it was getting to know a group of people in a short amount of time to do a job. You know, so we had a lot of communication issues. If, you know, we struggled getting to know each other, but it felt like the military, you know, getting to know your guys, them getting to know you, you get to know their weaknesses, them getting to know your weaknesses getting to know each other's strengths, backing each other up to accomplish, you know, these jobs that we did on the show. So being on the show made me feel like I was in the Marine Corps again when it came to that, the teamwork aspect. 
So when I won the show, it was like an emotional release. Like I know I cried on TV multiple times, which I didn't think I would do, but hey, when the emotions are running that high, like, and you do something that you set out to accomplish, man, it was very emotional. So, gotcha. but it was almost like, it kind of brought me back to Murph Marine Corps days. You know, my joking with people, just being jovial, like I, that kind of went away when I retired, when I kind of was a recluse to myself, you know, as that HR manager. And, you know, the show kind of made me feel like my old self again. So it was really cool in, in many ways. Very cathartic. Yes. Very good. Very good. Um, so there were individual and team champ- championships. Does that mean it was a show where, and I, I haven't seen the show. Uh, does it mean that there weren't any eliminations like a traditional reality show? It was almost like, Hey, you're still part of a team throughout the entire thing. Yep. So the way it works. So every episode normally starts off, the first part episode is a team challenge. So the teams, there's six on six on one team, six on the other, three males, three females. So you'll do a team job together. And the team that wins that particular job will win $2,000 a piece. Then the second episode, part of the episode is the individual challenge. Now, if you get, and every week somebody gets eliminated okay. from the individual. So the next episode they will stay with their team and do the team comp, but they'll just sit out of the individual. Gotcha. So all 12 people that start the show will be there throughout the whole show. So it's a very unique show in the fact that when you get eliminated, you still stay on and compete with your team. Well, I just said, so it really gives you a chance to get to know those people that whole time, but it also gives a chance for America or the audience to get to know those people Instead of, okay, I have a favorite. Oh, man, they're eliminated week two. Well, that's a bummer. Now I don't get to see them anymore. And now they get to stay on the show, and you can still stay with your favorite person. Even though they're not competing individually, you can still root them on in the team aspect. That's really cool to hear. And really, that is, that is a unique concept. I like to, I like to hear that. Um, for you, what was the funnest or best event, in your opinion, for you? Well, so if... So people that watch the show know that we, as a team, so my team was called Savage Crew and we won the first team challenge and then we lost like four in a row. Um, We just, our communication was off. We were arguing with each other, but then with each loss, we got to know each other a little bit more. We got to grow stronger a little bit more because you spend like 12 to 14 hours a day with everybody. Um, you know, you're in the van together going to the job sites, you're talking about stuff. Um, so you really get to know them and you have a lot of time to talk about the losses and the wins. Well, we had a challenge where we started making our comeback. It's, we did a moving challenge. We had to move. So it was, like I said, the jobs are based upon real life jobs. So we were in a neighborhood in LA somewhere, North of LA. And they had rented like houses, like in a residential neighborhood. And now the garages were filled up with, you know, Hollywood furniture, meaning that, you know, each garage had the exact same amount of furniture. So the job was to move all the stuff from the garage and put them in these two moving trailers. And the first team to close the door on their trailer is the winner. And, you know, we had lost four in a row. And the, the week before that, we were close to winning. And it was a heartbreaking defeat. Mm-hmm. But we even learned more about each other. But on that moving challenge, when we closed the door and Phil declared us the winner, the, all the emotion that people see, us cheering and jumping around, shouting, is 100% real emotion. That is like six people coming together as a one team and celebrating our victory. That is by far my favorite episode is because that shows six people who truly give a damn about each other celebrating like our win. That that's my favorite episode is just because like I said, the military, that's like celebrating a victory or maybe bringing back everybody from overseas or, you know, accomplishing a training goal. You know, you did it together as a team and that's what that celebration on TV was, was like a legitimate celebration because the show is real. There's no script. Phil just said, be yourselves and do this stuff the best you can. That was our guidance. So that's why I really 
really like the show because there's nothing fake about the show. It's a hundred percent real. There's no script to read. There's no, they're going to game it for this person to win. It's, it's a real um, legitimate show. Very good. Very good. Now, um, are there more shows like this that you are interested in? And if you were, if you were to pick another show to go on to compete on, what would it be? I know you want to go on the all-star version when they have an all-star uh, version, but, but if there was another show, what would it be? You know, it's funny because I, I don't really watch much reality TV. <laughs> so <laughs> Me to even be on a show, so to, so to even be on a show is kind of ironic. Um, I think Forged and Fire is really cool, but I, I can't, I don't have any of those skills, but it just, I mean, that's a very cool show. I like watching that, but you know, I've only watched, I only watched one episode of Survivor and that's because when they started doing Tough as Nails commercials last year, that was the first commercial I got to see was during a Survivor, Survivor episode. So I watched Survivor just so I could watch the commercials for Tough as Nails. Um, but other than that, I can't really think of any show that I'd want to be on. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, Forge and Fire, man, that's a good show. As far as when you we talk about craftsmanship and artistry, um, I think people don't, when they look at trades, they look at trades from a technical perspective. But when you look at Forge and, a show like Forge and Fire or, or that trade in general or many trades, there's a level of art that people, I think, maybe have not appreciated in trades in a long time. Is that accurate, you think? What do you think? Oh, uh, it's very accurate. And that's one thing, you know, and I, like I said, I work at the University of Central Missouri and I advocate for education. But, you know, there's sometimes where a standard college degree isn't right for everybody, you know. And so what I remind veterans about is, you know, you can use your GI Bill for other things other than their traditional college. You know, the trades, for example, is a great way to use your education benefits and learn a skill. Um, so I, you know, I try to promote UCM as much as I can, but there are times where promoting an institution isn't in the best interest of the veteran. It's, you know, you have to really promote what's best for them, Yeah. let them make that decision. So I try to give them all, you know, when I talk to a veteran, I just talk to them about what'd you do in the military? What would you like to do? What are your interests? And then we just try to match up the best, um, institution for them, whether or not, like I said, that's a trade school, a technical school, you know, a, a traditional four-year college. So very good. Very good. Yeah. The trades, I think like my dad was a construction worker growing up, ended up spending his later days in a factory just, you know, cause physically couldn't do the construction anymore. Um, so said my grandpa was an engineer on the railroads during world war two. You know, then after that he was a house painter. So everybody in my family is blue collar. So, you know, I, there's no shame in that. I mean, that's blue collar is what built America. hundred percent. You need blue collar. You need those, you know, like as Joe, as uh, uh, what's his name would put it, those dirty jobs, you know, as Mike Rowe would put it. Um, so I saw on your, <laughs> I saw on your Instagram that you're now modeling for area international. I saw it in your little bio there. Uh, how did, did that opportunity come through tough as after tough as nails? Uh, how'd that happen? And and what's, the, what's that experience been like? Oh, it's been pretty fun. We, um, so I, you know, I had a lot of people congratulate me after, after winning and, you know, it was awesome to connect. I had so many people connect with me after the show. I had like 1500 messages and like, it took me several weeks, but I answered everybody back. Even if it was just a thank you. I had Marines that I hadn't seen since like 1991, 92, wow. reach out to me and say, hey, Murph, congratulations. This is so-and-so from HMLA, whatever, or this unit. I'm like, man, I, I haven't heard from you in like 20 years. So it was awesome to reconnect with so many people. But it's a lot of the people that reached out. So Tony from Ariat, she's like the marketing um, boss. And she was a huge fan of the show. And she said, Hey, would you be interested in trying your hand at modeling? And I'm like, like, like what kind of modeling? We talk like runway modeling or modeling. <laughs> she's like, she's like, no, she's like, I just, um, you know, for our workwear stuff, you know, cause Ariat does, you know, they're huge in the rodeo scene, but they also do workwear, you know, work boots, work pants, um, work shirts. Um, 
you give it a, well, you want to give it a shot? I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll give it a try. <laughs> so um, earlier this year, um, they flew me out to, to Union City, California, to their headquarters. And I spent eight hours putting on pants, shirts, boots, standing in front of the camera, um, you know, sashaying, if you will, side to side, different poses. Like, you know, it was it was more way more fun than I thought it would be, because I think if you have a sense of humor, I think that helps because you can kind of laugh at yourself because being a Marine, one of the last things I ever thought would be add model to that resume. But sure enough, they 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 liked having me out there and um, I'm officially now one of their workwear models. So they asked me if I'd be interested in staying on. So now I go out every couple of months for, for a couple of day photo shoots. So I'll be in their, their e-commerce catalog and like paper catalogs and things of that nature. So there you go. I, it's there just you. a fun, fun. It's, it's just fun. And you know, I'm at the point in my life where I just want to do fun stuff now. So it's Heck nothing yeah. I thought I would ever do, but I'm glad I took, I'm glad I took the opportunity to do so. Very cool. Very cool. Um, okay. Murph, uh, is there a veteran nonprofit or a veteran or another veteran in the veteran community whom you've had an experience with or whom you've worked with that you'd like to mention? Yeah, I would say his name is Brian Shantosh. You may, you may know him. Um, so Brian is a, a Navy cross recipient for his actions in Fallujah. Um, he's a retired Marine major. He runs what's called the big fish foundation. So it's a group that helps veterans. Um, I mean, he does a lot of behind the scenes stuff to help the veteran community. But if anybody's looking to get involved with the veteran community, um, I would say he's a great organization. And I just did a podcast recently as well with the Travis Mannion Foundation. Mm. Um, Ryan Mannion, you know, started that foundation in honor of her brother. Oh, yeah. Um, those would be like my top two organizations that, that I think are just great veterans organizations. Um they do so much. They do a lot of outreach. You know, they help veterans in, in ways that, you know, the normal group can't. So it's a great group of people. Very good. Very good. Um, Murph, what's, uh, what's one thing that you learned during your time in the military that you apply to what you do today? Uh, I would say never, never pass up an opportunity. Like, so for example, when I was overseas, um, I know this, so we were in Qatar and this ship, we were on, we were in Qatar. We were up next to a, a port or a pier and this other, the, one of the biggest ships I've ever seen in my life is parked next to our, our ship. And, you know, it's a big cargo container ship. And, you know, I walked past it and I'm like, I'm with my company commander and we walked past them. I'm like, maybe they'll let us on. I want to take a look. So we, we just ask, can we go aboard and take a look? And they're like, absolutely. So they let us on. We, inside the ship, it looks like a parking garage. I mean, mm -hmm. there are like, like big tractors, excavators sitting here. And right on the other side are like Lamborghinis. And like it was a, the biggest, almost, it was the biggest parking garage you've ever seen. But it, it has such a mix of equipment. So just stuff like that or going to a place you've never got to go to because you know, you had the opportunity and you didn't pass it up. So it's the same thing. I had the opportunity not to apply for tough as nails. And, yeah. but you know, if I wouldn't have took up the opportunity when that show came on TV, would I've noticed it? Who knows? But if I did, I've been like, man, you just wasted that opportunity. So I would rather fell at something and at least know that I gave it a shot than to spend the rest of my life wondering, could I have done that or how well would I have done that? If I fell at it or if I'm not good at it, Hey, at least I know. But if I never take it up or that opportunity, then I'm going to second guess my decision or I'm going to think about that the rest of my life of what could have been. 100%. 100%. Okay. Um, you know, Murph, this is, this has been great. Um, is there anything that I've missed or haven't asked, or if you have a parting shot that you'd like to tell anybody that's listening to this, uh, that you'd like to share? No, I can't think of anything. That's usually what I end with is, you know, never pass up an opportunity. Cause like I said, 
the modeling thing, I just did it because I didn't want to pass up an opportunity because what happens if I passed it up and I would never know what it was like to stand there and change clothes all day and like all the stuff that happens behind the scenes of modeling, you know, you have so many people involved in like taking pictures and then you, you know, you have all the other people that are involved. And so anything small or big, no matter what the opportunity is, that's what I try to lead people with is, man, just do it because you never know what can come of it. So very good. Very good. Well, Murph, appreciate you taking the time. Um, we are out. Y'all take care. We got to get them one way or the other. Machine gun. Firefight bullets fly to my brain. Simplify to another campaign. My desk is a rock where the drug lords cut up millions. My pen is a 7.62 round that'll cut them down in an instant. made bullet in my bag raining down lead punching that clock get them boys I'm laying down cover machine gun Firefight bullets fly they in my brain simplify do or die another campaign here we go lock and load over 331 lug a thousand rounds and I ain't bringing back one